They're still waiting to be led to Peter. Yeah, I'm here to so doc, then you can start. Okay. okay. So I think it's uh, three minutes past seven. Shall we wait for a few more? Peter? Oh, you're good to go, Doc. Good to go. Okay. Um, so good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for attending this uh, webinar. Um, welcome. The topic for today is effective communication for better mental health, something we definitely all need. Um, just that uh, you feel free to suggest any future uh, topics, any uh, subject or any topic that you'd like us to talk about in the future, you're very welcome. So I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, Ken Kenya Medical Association, uh, Clinical Psychologist Association, KPA, COA, and NANAC members who are um, the people who organize for this, the associations that organize for these webinars. Um, Dr. Somba sent an apology today, so he's not with us. Um, but I would like to introduce uh, or to let um, a KMA representative, Dr. Haas, say Jumbo. Dr. Haas. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haemba. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Santeni Sana for making the time to come and join us today for this very interesting topic. We're looking forward to learn from our speaker, Asante. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Josephine. I'd like also to invite Dr. Gitao, who is a representative from uh, Kenya Psychiatric Association, to say hello. Good evening. I'm happy to be here and I look forward to uh, hearing what Dr. Wawa has for us today. I, pray, I hope that uh, we shall live here wiser and knowing how to communicate better. So thank you and Karibuni Sana. Thank you, um, Dr. Gitao. I also represented this uh, Clinical Psychologist Association of Kenya. 
uh, of which I am chair, but we have other members here who are with us every time we hold this. So um, Yvonne Norando, maybe say a word. Good evening, everyone. I am happy to be back. I'm happy to join during this uh, webinar today. Hope that we shall learn together. Santi. And uh, not forgetting Takoba, who is uh, highly instrumental in uh, this webinars all the way from Eldoret, uh, Dr. Koba. Thank you, Dr. Liz, for giving me this opportunity. I'm as excited as everyone to listen to how to improve my own communication. I, I'm just from seeing some patients and I kept telling them, I don't have any medication for you. I just want you to, it was a couple. You just need to learn how to, improve, to communicate better and I don't need to treat one of them who had some issues. So <laughs> I'm excited about it really, because I feel like it's very, very relevant that if we knew how to communicate better, many of us not be as distressed as we are. So I'm excited and I wish ourselves well as we learn tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Koba. Now, um, I, I just before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to ask uh, all of us if we have any questions during um, the webinar, please drop the questions in the Q&A. And if you have any comments, you may drop them in the chat box. Please remember that uh, all CPD points will be sent after, um, after this uh, webinar uh, and they'll be sent via, via email. Uh, I hope you have registered. So that's what we use also to, to send your CPD points. So now I'd like to welcome our speaker, our, our presenter today. As I said, the topic is effective communication for better mental health. Um, Presenter is Dr. Sarah Wawa, a consultant psychiatrist at Machakos Level 5. She holds a in public health and is interested in promotion of good mental health. Uh, her hobbies um, include running marathons and ultra marathons. Um, I don't know if we know what ultra marathons are. I learned this today. Uh, ultra marathon is a distance longer than 42 kilometers. So, Dr. Wawa, has run um, to Naivasha, has run to Nakur, has done a 100 kilometer run, and the last run she has ever done was uh, 360 kilometers over five days to Moshi. She also hikes, rock climbs, swims, and um, generally she's just very outdoorsy, and uh, she also loves gardening. So that is our, our presenter today. Uh, it will be very interesting uh, just hearing her. I'd also like to introduce our panelist, our chief panel, who is um, our very own CPAC clinical psychologist. She's, uh, she's also a lecturer at the University of Nairobi, and this is Dr. Anne Boyle. So um, Dr. Wawa, please uh, put up your presentation and you may start. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And thank you for that rosy um, introduction. <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you, everybody, for, for showing up for this. I uh, hope we learned something at the end of this. Um, right. OK. Uh, so when I, I was told about this topic at first, I, my, my first thoughts were, why are we talking about this? Is it that we've exhausted the, 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 the traditional topics that we talk about? Or is it that now we're becoming a bit forth, uh, out, outgoing and exploring more things? I hope it's the latter, not the former. So today we're going to talk about effective communication for better mental health. My name is uh, Sarah Wawa. So I, I, I really like this uh, WHO definition of mental health because each time, every time uh, when I tell people I work in the, in the mental health de department, what they think about is um, people with uh, debilitating mental illnesses. So schizo, they think of schizophrenia or mania. And they never think that mental health also 
just uh, refers to like you you yourself uh, without an illness you being in a state of, of wellness or mental wellness where you're able to realize your abilities you can cope with the normal stresses of life uh, you can work productively wherever it is you are and you're able to to make a contribution to the community that you are in so um, as I was going through this again, I thought, who are the stakeholders in mental health? Who are these people who we need to communicate to or who are these people who need to communicate to each other so as to just um, make sure that everybody is more or less on the same page when it comes to mental health? So the policy makers, uh, this is like uh, the World Health Organization, the, the governments that we have in our country, it would be the national governments and the county governments, uh, then the civil society organizations, so the mental health practitioners, some who are in this forum, so this might be psychiatrists or the clinical officers who work in mental health, the nurses, and then also the other healthcare workers, because we realize that uh, the mental health practitioners are not, are not uh, enough to, to cover the whole population of Kenya, which means we need other people to help. So most of the times, the first contact with a, with a healthcare provider would be a non-mental health practitioner. So we need to have them on board. Then the professional bodies, uh, such as the KB, KPA, which are represented in this meeting today. Uh, it's good to not forget the media because um, each time there's a story out there, each time we need um, some something just uh, let out that it's the media that comes into play. So we need to remember them as very important stakeholders. Then uh, the consumers of mental health services, these are our patients or our clients, whichever way we are more comfortable calling them. And uh, also not forget the caregivers because we have some mental illnesses that, um, that, that make somebody unable to take care of themselves. So the caregiver comes in and is the one who is maybe buying the medication or is the one who's giving the medication, bringing this patient to, to the hospital. So we need to remember that when we are communicating, we need to communicate to the caregivers as well. Then um, let's not forget the community, uh, which is um, where we can start to just promote good mental, uh, mental health. And uh, just to put it out there, maybe this is where you can get help. These are the illnesses that are there. So those are some of the things that we might need to communicate to to the community and also when we're talking to our fund, fund, funding agency or, or donors, maybe um, whenever it is that you're looking for funding for doing a study or doing any project that, that is mental health related. Okay, so I really had to dig back and, and go and ask myself, what is communication? I think the last time I asked myself this, I must have been in, in primary school um, I don't know if it was an English class or what class it was, but then I remembered that communication is basically uh, it's an exchange of information. So there's a sender, there's a recipient, and then there's a message in between that is sent from the, the sender to the recipient. And then there's usually a means of communication in between. So whether it, it, you're using a face-to-face -face communication, which is what we routinely do um, in, in our clinics and in the hospitals, and uh, maybe this is what we used to do when we were having our webinars before COVID. But then the written, written means of communication, they, you might be using this electronic means of communication or mobile communications. And also what we're doing right now, this uh, Zoom is a means of communication. So um, basically, uh, then the other thing that I, I, I discovered when I was, I was just researching about communication is that it's in, important to get feedback. So it's not just, uh, just um, for you to say, maybe even when you're talking to your patients, you're like, okay, you need to do this. You need to take these medicines. Uh, if you don't take these medicines, it's, it's, it's going to, to do one, two, three. You're not going to feel better. We also need to just allow them to give us feedback. So... Um, so, so like, for instance, your patients, you need to be able to ask them, do you have any questions? Do you have any concerns? Would you like to tell me anything? So that you know if they've understood, if they have any, any concerns that you might need to allay, so which me means you need to communicate back to them. So it's very important not to forget the feedback aspect. Now, what are the goals of communication? So these are broad, just broad goals. Anytime you're communicating for any, any reason, not, it might not have to be mental health related. But what you are trying to do is you're trying to inform. 
So in our case, we're trying to inform about mental illnesses. We're trying to inform about, about um, the, the treatment options that are available. So we might be informing our colleagues that there is a patient I'm sending your way. Uh, the other thing is we, to request, so you might be communicating to request a patient, maybe you need to come back to me on this day, or you're requesting your colleague, I do not know what to do anymore, could you take over from here? So to also to persuade or to influence, so if you're just trying to influence people to do better, just just to, to take part in activities that will that will make them have better mental health, uh, for instance, what... Um, what is happening right now. Um, for those who, who may not know, we're, we're just trying to influence people to do exercise for mental health. So there's a social media campaign that is trying to just show you, you do a video of you doing a, a, an activity and um, and uh, then you, you tag a few of your friends, just trying to influence them also to move for mental health and also to just build relationships. So this might be therapeutic relationships with the patients, it might, be therap it might be relationships with your colleagues, or it might be you're trying to build relationship, relationships with uh, policymakers or with the uh, with, uh, donors. So um, we've already touched a bit on this, about the channels of communications. We said the one that is commonest is face-to-face. Uh, -face. So when you're sitting, across your patient in your clinic and you're talking to them and they're talking back to you, that is face to face. And then of course we have the, uh, the broadcast media, something that's also sometimes called uh, mass communication. So the radios and the TVs that reach many people at the same time. Uh, then you have mobile communications. So these are communications that take, take place over uh, a wireless network. So each time you pick up your phone and call somebody, or you pick up your phone and send a text message or uh, send a WhatsApp. That's also a channel of communication. Um, so then there's electronic communication. The earliest ones were the telegrams and the fax machines, which are working in some places, but they have quickly been, uh, been um, uh, taken over by the telephone and the email. So here we also have the newer methods, uh, web pages and the chat rooms and video conferencing, what we are doing right now. And then we also have the written communication where you could write down a letter or a note or a memo. So um, traditionally communication is, is uh, said to either be upwards or downwards or horizontal. And this would be in, a, in an organizational kind of setting. But I thought for us it could also apply because um, maybe depending on where the flow of information is. So whoever has more, more information and is trying to talk to somebody else, you might now say that you're doing a downward kind of a communication and upwards could be um, somebody who has more information about you, about, about some, something related to mental health as opposed to you. And horizontal could be just you communicating as colleagues. Okay, so... Um, these are some pointers I picked up to try and develop your communication skills. So um, it's important for everyone in, in, this, in this forum to just look at these uh, different modes of communication and think which one is it that I need to, 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 to better? Which one do I need to better? Because it's very individual and you need to set your own personal goals. So whatever it is that I might be struggling with might not be what somebody else is struggling with. So you need to just find out which is which which part you're not very good at and just try and make make yourself better. And it's something that's continuous that you can um, just make better every day. So verbal communication, uh, some of the pointers are you should have a strong, confident speaking voice. So um, it's always interesting when I, when, when I think about that, I think about medical school and I think about uh, the times when we had the vivas and uh, sometimes we'd be told, you know, you don't really need to know what you're talking about. As long as you sound confident and you sound like you know what you're talking about, you're likely to, to just make your way through it. So I'm not saying that we should, we should pretend and just fumble our way through, but, but I'm saying that um, having a strong, confident voice is, 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 is important, but of course you should know your content. Uh, you should practice active listening such that when somebody is talking to you, you're not just seated there all cold and uh, not, not reacting, not talking back. Uh, maybe 
it, it might sound like a good thing to do where I'm, like, I'm giving you space. I want you to talk from the time you're done and if time you begin until you're done. But then in between, I, I, I need to know, are you, are you talking back to me? So sometimes even on the phone, when I call somebody and, and, and I speak for maybe two, three minutes and they're not saying anything. And I wonder, is this person listening to me or not? So you need to be able to, to make the person, the patient feel like then you're listening to them. So some of the things you, you could ask specific, specific questions uh, relating to what they've just said, to just like to prompt them. Uh, you can just reflect on what they have talked about. Okay. The other thing that is, uh, is, is, uh, um, is um, some of the other pointer is just to avoid filler words. So that's, I know we're very tempted to say, mm, uh, uh, so try as much as possible to avoid that if you can, but it's something that you can practice. So um, your nonverbal communication, just be aware of uh, how, how your emotions can be expressed physically. So this is something you need to, to, to just make sure you're, you're very aware of. So some days you wake up and you, you don't feel like you want to work and you really want to just go to that ward round or that clinic and get out as fast as possible. You might be having some issues at home. So you need to be very, very deliberate about how you act because sometimes you just might have this closed body language where your face just looks bored or blank and all you want you're thinking is can this be over and done with so that i can go on to what i'm doing next so be very intentional with uh, your nonverbal communication try and and just uh, just open uh, look like you're open to listening to what your patient is saying so avoid crossing your arms crossing your legs um, look directly at the patient as much as possible and then I, I also, this, this was interesting. You could actually mimic nonverbal communications that you find effective. So if you were speaking to somebody at some point and uh, maybe you saw them nod as you were talking or, or, or the, 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 maybe they, they gave you a pat on your back and you felt like, yeah, this person is actually listening to me. So maybe you can try that on someone else. It, it, it could work. So when you're doing uh, written communication, so this we most of the times we will do it when uh, maybe you're writing for the print media or you're writing a discharge summary or you're writing a referral note. Uh, so you need to be very simple in how you're writing and to be appropriate. So what you'd write to your colleague is not the same thing that you would write to a patient okay, or what you'd write to, to, to the whole community. Then just pay attention to details. Of course, you should be detailed, but don't be overly detailed. Uh, then don't rely on your tone. Or what this means is that um, when you're writing, don't expect everybody to any, everybody to know that oh this this I was joking here, or or I was um, I was not too serious. This, this is supposed to be sarcastic. So you don't have that that um, you don't have the same. Uh, the same way you would be doing a verbal communication and you'd be able to in, to change your tone. You're not able to do that when you're doing a written thing. So you need to be very, very careful. Um, I've, I've had instances where I have felt, um, I have felt, I've, I have had this problem where maybe I've texted someone and I was joking, but then the person cannot get the joke because there was not, I could not communicate my tone in, in, in the text. So I have learned to be a bit careful about this. Then just take time to review your written communication. So you don't want to, 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 to write, write something and just send it out there when you have not gone through it. Are there any typos? Are there any things that you feel like you could have written in a simpler way? Um, so there was a time I used to write a, a blog a while back. I, I stopped. I think I'm, I should try and get back to that. It was focusing on mental health issues. And uh, I remember each time I would run this through, through a friend of mine who was very stern and uh, she would always look at it through these eyes and tell me, no, I think you're doing, you should change this, you should change this. So if you have somebody like that, you could always run your, your written word through them. So... Um, the other thing is just uh, if you find anything interesting, any anything that you, you any writing that you find effective or enjoyable, just keep them and try and mimic that tone. Then, uh, for visual, if, if if you need to use visual aids, 
anywhere in your communication, just ask before using if it's appropriate and consider your audience. So it would uh, not be right for you to just throw in pie charts in when you're when you're doing maybe a community awareness and then you start saying uh, this is 50 percent of of people with depression have these or 60 percent of people live and they don't understand what you're saying and if you must use these visual aids you should be ready to to explain them to your audience so then what are the benefits of effective communication for mental health um, this will help us be able to sol solve problems quicker so for instance, if um, I'm, having, I'm having some sort of a problem in my clinic and I don't know what to do, and if I can easily just pick up my, my, my phone, call my colleague or call somebody who's my senior and just ask them, how do you think I can go about this? So if we have that, that kind of a relationship where you don't think too much, uh, maybe I could give a, another example. If you're in a, in a facility that has interns and maybe the intern is going through some problems and they are afraid of calling you because when they call you, you are probably not going to respond very nicely. So they might have this kind of a problem. So it also helps with, uh, with you just having better clinical acumen, especially if you're able to look at the patient's non-verbal cues. And if you appear to be open when you're communicating, the patient is more likely to talk to you and uh, open up and tell you things that they might not tell you if they were not feeling like you were open to talking to them. Also, it will help with making decision, better decisions. This is just tied to the problem solving. And also gives you a, a better professional image when you are able to communicate effectively. I mean, if you're able to stand in front of a group of people or if you're able to talk to your patients and take them through from the beginning to the end what you expect the treatment to look like, uh, they're more likely to just feel that you, you have better knowledge of the subject than somebody who might just brush them off quickly and tell them, okay, you have this, uh, this is what you take, by." So we, we, we need to be very careful about how we talk to our patients. Uh, it also gives you better control of what information is out there. Okay, If we are, as a mental health practitioners or just as the healthcare workers, as a professional bodies, if we are, we are very effective in communicating and we are the ones who are out there telling people, this is what happens, this is what happens, then we will have uh, uh, the information on mental health that is out there will be things that are right and things that uh, we can control. And uh, also to just uh, help us have stronger relations with uh, our colleagues, with our patients. It will just establish better rapport with them and uh, their treatment will be better. Uh, the other thing is uh, consistency. So if, um, if colleagues, for instance, if we, we talk about the same thing and we're on the same page, so if the patient comes another day, which happens a lot, our clinic can find somebody else. The next time they'll find somebody else. If you're all consistent in your communication and, and, and on the content of what you're talking about, then you're more likely to, to, to just have a, a better treatment for your patient with that consistency. Also, it just increases productivity. Okay, so what is it that we need to communicate? So this is not exhaustive. This is just some of the things that... Um, that I, 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 I thought that we should be able to do to each of our, our, of, our, of our clients. So to the consumers of mental health services and their caregivers, when they come to us, we should be able to, to psychoeducate them. So what this means is just be able to take them through the illness, tell them what we know about the illness, tell them um, what the signs and the symptoms are, tell them what are the possible causes of these illnesses, give them what treatment options they have. If you're going to start them on medications, to take them to the medications, tell them what adverse effects they, they expect, tell them how long you expect them to take the medication, then just open up and ask them if there's anything else they might need to know. So you, 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 might, you might be... Um, there are things that you might not think that you need to tell them, but when you open up, then they're able to tell you other things. For instance, I, uh, two weeks ago, I had somebody just ask me, uh, I have been newly diagnosed with this illness. Um, are my children going to get it? It was something that was really concerning to him. And uh, after we talked to him, he was able to, to calm down and he was able to understand. Then um, the caregivers also should just be given 
the same information and should also be told about the early warning signs of relapse. Uh, apart from that, they should just be told what to expect from this illness and also just take them through how to cope if it's something that they might not, uh, something that uh, they might need to be taught. For instance, I think two, three weeks ago, we had a, a webinar on dementia and the caregivers, it came out very, very clearly that the caregivers really needed to be taken care of as well. So then also for the for the clients and the caregivers, uh, just if there are any support groups you're aware of, let them know, or any other pointers they may need to just make their life a bit easier as they're dealing with this illness. But to the community, uh, to the community, we might use uh, broadcast uh, media just to reach as many as possible or this electronic means such as the social media platforms. So we just, for them, we what needs to be communicated is, is mental health awareness. So we need to, to tell them what mental illnesses are there, what are the treatments, options, where can they get help, what are the preventive measures they can do. We need to debunk all the myths that are out there about mental illnesses. And we also just need to have open channels for communication, such as uh, the suicide hotlines that are that are up and running currently. Then uh, to the other stakeholders, you might be communicating to them about need for funding or other needs you might have. Uh, so basically, I like to think of us as the middlemen or the ambassadors between the patients and the the, the government and, and uh, the NGOs and WHO. Then also we need to communicate among or between the healthcare workers. Most of the time, this will be through a referral note. Sometimes it's nice to just follow up with a phone call if it's somebody that you're able to, to just call and uh, let them know that I'm sending so and so to you. Uh, it's important to just put in, to be very clear and put in the correct information that you need to put in, in, in those case summaries or those referral notes. All right. Um, Dr. Mboyo is going to talk about this, the barriers to effective communication and how to break this after we're done. So I will go on, just talk about um, the effects of poor communication. So if we, don't, if we don't make it our goal to be out there and communicate about mental health, then there'll be a lot of misinformation going around. People will, will give up all, will give out all sorts of myths and, and, and and our patients will be lost to follow up if we don't tell them what exactly to explain, I mean, to expect. They will not comply to medication. If they get side, the side effects and we were not clear in telling them, hey, you can get one, two, three, if you get this, you need to do this or you need to come back to me and tell me what is going on so that I can help you. Uh, there'll also be poor continuity of care if you have a poor therapeutic alliance with your patients and poor professional relationships. So then how do we improve communication? Um, continuous education, like what we're doing right now, we can also have a communication skills training where we bring in a communication experts and just let them walk us through this, how best to go about this, how to, to, to get better maybe in your verbal communication, in your written communication. It's also important to familiarize yourself with the content so that when you're going out there, you're not fumbling, you're talking confidently and you're able to see what it is you're talking about. And it's also important to familiarize yourself with the available means of communication. So the old ones, the old means we, most of us are okay with, but the emerging means that are coming up that we need to really go out of our way to find out how to use them um, who, who, who usually uses them, who will it reach out to. And we also need to embrace ICT. So this is tied up to the last point and we should aim to reach many more people as possible. Okay, so I will, I'll just conclude with this, uh, what I just spoke about in the last slide, about how to uh, embrace ICT in communication. Liz, I don't know if I can ask you to just um, maybe ask, uh, somebody to just go through this and tell us how many of these they know or they use so that we know where we are at. Is that okay? Please. Sure, that's fine. Um, maybe let's ask um, Yvonne, how many of these uh, do you know? <laughs> or do you use? 
Oh, Yvonne, Orlando? <clears throat> I use uh, most of them, Apple. apart from Twitter. Uh, one which has a yellow thing, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and the W one, I don't know what that is. And the pin interest, I don't use that also. Oh, and I also use Instagram. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Yvonne is, 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 is kind of young, so I guess she would know most of these things. I, I, would, I would have liked to know somebody who's, who's a bit older if they use any of this, because each time we, we have to even do Zoom, sometimes we have people say, yeah, I'm too old, I can't do this, this is too much, I, I don't know how to, to do this, but it's important for all of us to try and familiarize ourselves with this. So the importance of this uh, embracing ICT is that it's so convenient. Like right now, we are all sitting in our living rooms and we are having a conversation. Uh, it's time consuming because we don't need to write letters which go through the post anymore. You just write an email and very quickly it's got into the other person. Uh, it also helps. Um, it's cost effective and uh, we're able to just bridge the cultural gaps that we might have with other people from other cultures, other nations. We're able to now talk to them very quickly. It's increased our interactions. But that said, uh, we need to be very careful as well because this has been, uh, this ICT has been shown to to, to bring help, to bring about issues with privacy. There have been issues with cyberbullying. There have been issues with some cultures trying to override others, the ones that are a bit more stronger and also the reliability of information such as um, some web pages such as wikipedia anybody can just go there and and change uh, and change and write whatever it is they, they they want to write and nobody's really checking and also there are cyber threats that come in in into place so things like um you might have some viruses uh, some people might find it's not so easy to get these devices the mobile devices that others have and uh, they might find it hard to set devices so those are some of the the cons and the pros of of ict but i think for us it's very important for us to embrace ict i've seen people doing um youtube videos uh i don't know if that's what's called a vlog i think it is maybe somebody will educate me i'm also learning uh so there are people who are doing uh tweets tweet chats on twitter uh, just a ra uh, raising awareness on mental health. I've seen podcasts. Uh, I've seen the KPA challenge on Facebook and uh, and Instagram, and uh, also right now I think we're streaming live on Facebook. So um, you can see that you can reach a lot more people when you embrace these technologies than when we we shun them. So maybe um, Yvonne, I can let. This is called Wattpad. It's it's a um, it's a it's a blog. A blog platform which one did you say you didn't know this yellow one it's something called snapchat i'm told if you want to reach teenagers that's the place to go and you said you know this this is pinterest yes so that's the end of my presentation dr mboy will take over from here thank you very much dr wawa And um, I'll take over on how to break barriers that hinder effective communication. And uh, taken that also because Dr. Wawa had the idea. And the barriers that um, he wanted to talk about were language and hearing language in terms of semantics. How, when I say a statement, is it within the area where I live in? Is it uh, appropriate? Do the people understand the same way that I've, I've said? So in terms of involved communication uh, barriers that involve words, uh, you can also send disorganized uh, messages in terms of uh, people read it's not because it was not clear they didn't manage, but the flow, the flow is quite uh, disorganized so that even much as I try to understand, I, it's not clear. There's ambiguity, 
And uh, here, again, the communicator not uh, giving very clear information. The message is ambiguous and they'll be like, now what did this person mean? Whether it's your patient, whether when you explain, uh, you tell them, they'll be like, what does it mean? And then we have still a, a lot of information overload, too much information, which uh, sometimes you not, it will be too much. And you know what we do is just pick the most important and leave the le and leave the rest. And we are like, I thought I said, and it was like, it was too much. I did not understand. So we've got, as it has been said, it's got to be very clear to the point and that which is uh, uh, needed. Then filtering where the individual is just, um, or the information is, uh, is not giving the correct everything or the information that is needed. So in terms of when we are constructing or when we are talking to someone, we need to be very clear of the information that we give. Then also affecting effective communication is people's background, attitudinal differences, uh, whether you're from the same community or not, but we have different attitudes towards uh, a certain information, demographic differences, could be age differences, as has been said, she was asking those communication things and a number I had not even seen, I wasn't aware, so demographic differences, uh, it could also be even male, female, level of education, and all that, uh, lack of common experience or perspective. And um, most of the times we do not have a common experience or perspective, but can I be able to communicate the information despite the fact that we do not have the same uh, experience. So it goes back to attitude, uh, attitudinal differences. Jumping to conclusion, that is very common. You are getting information and even before then you are like, this is how it ended. You're like, oh God, I had thought it ended up the other way around. And then uh, we have emotions and our personality, our emotions when we, are, when we are speaking, when we are communicating, when we are writing, how are our emotions at that particular point? And then the different personality. And uh, we find even some will be very, very fast. Others will be slow. Others will be calm. Others will be very emotional when they are talking. Then uh, we have our cultural differences uh, and which will come in terms of how we were brought up. Maybe you are told not to be, children are to be, or certain people are not to be seen. They are just up to, you just remain there. So cultural differences. And therefore this affects when it comes to the communication because I'm not used to. I wasn't brought up to express myself then we have the physical barriers. What channels are available? Now we have many, but what do the people have? Uh, physical uh, disabilities in terms of could be even hearing problems, could be reading. Then we have technical difficulties. Good example, uh, all the Zooms, the way it has been given, some will take time uh, to start out and we'll take explaining, go to this, press this, and so on. And then, uh, I'm seeing the, the physical barriers to non-verbal communication. So if, if somebody, for example, is not seeing, or there's a barrier, then they do not notice the non-verbal communication, which she's told, Dr. Wawa has told us, is very, very important. Next slide, please. So how do we overcome some of this? One of the ways I came across as I was reading is to ensure that as we communicate to the people, ensure the comfort of the person you are communicating with or the, your own comfort. Now, if a person has come to your office and um, you've given them a very uncomfortable seat or you go to a place it is an uncomfortable seat, for sure, no matter what you are telling them, they will not be paying attention. So 
let us make the individuals we are communicating to or ourselves be comfortable so that we can be able to pay attention to what we are, they are saying or what even we are saying. Uh, so some of these uh, discomforts, they can be uh, physical as I've given, they can be psychological, they could be emotional. And we know those apart from uh, sit, there could be lots of noise which is uh, even blocking what you're saying. We could be having a patient who is feeling pain or you are in pain and we know that no matter what you are telling them, you are telling them how to take. So if they are in so much pain, they will not be paying attention. They could be having psychological pain from whatever cause. There could be hunger. So should we alleviate all these uh, discomfort, then it's one way for which the person can listen better. And even for you, you are able to communicate to the, to the person better. Next, next slide, please. We can also reduce the barriers that involve the language. Uh, if, for example, you go to a place where the language you are used to is not what is spoken there, then I think it would be better if you can be able to learn the language a little bit. And also in terms of phrases, uh, because you might find the way we are used to saying certain phrases or they might be offensive to other people. So it could be very important that if we can be able to learn, and particularly if you get to an area where even the national language is not, people are not very good at it, it would help. That way you'll be able to communicate uh, in a better way, simplify the language or the message without changing the meaning. Uh, sometimes you can be, you can communicate, or uh, you're in a meeting with somebody and certain very heavy words are used even to, uh, and then you are left like, oh God, what does that word mean? So you can imagine you are communicating to, your, to a patient with a man uh, with, who is uh, having, who is not well, you are giving them those very heavy book words and they'll be like, uh, what does that mean? So if we could simplify the message so that the, we do without changing the meaning and then the person, it becomes easy. Use complicated words to when you are talking to a colleague whom you are same level and you understand the topic. It is all important, and this has been brought up by Dr. Wawa, ask to always ask if what you have said is clear. Do they have a question? Did, is, is it okay? Because they'll go out there and you, they'll be like, what did the doctor say? And even if they had been accompanied and the patient is asking the person they, who had accompanied, what did the doctor say? What did they mean? They'll be like, I don't know. You reach home and you are being asked, what was the meeting all about? I did, it wasn't very clear. So I think it's always important to find out, is it clear? Did it, does it make meaning? Or would you want it in, uh, said in another way? Next slide, please. And uh, so in terms of if we can, if we find that we have an area that we are not good at in terms of our communication, uh, then the key thing is know thyself. I like that because if I know myself, I know my weakness, I know an area, then I'm going to work on it. And it doesn't hurt even to go to an expert in communication and tell them this is an area where I have a weakness. Uh, knowing myself or knowing thyself becomes critical also because you know in your bad days you be watchful you be careful in what you are saying because sometimes you are like uh, don't talk to me i'm in a bad mood no that is your bad mood 
maybe if you did not want to be talked to, then you did not have to be there. So I think knowing uh, yourself, knowing our limits becomes important because you make sure that we know how uh, to say what, when not to say, when to keep quiet and when not to make, uh, to talk a lot. And this also helps us to know when we know ourselves, how we communicate, whether with our boss, with our colleague, a friend, a relative, or even with our patient. And that way we find that we try as much. We are not saying that we will not make mistakes, no, we'll be, but you'll be able to minimize. I remember Dr. Kova saying if she wish she can know what to do. I think knowing ourselves is a very important way because it helps us to be watchful, to be careful in what and how we are saying, otherwise we shall be rude. And then we are like, oh God, I did not even know I was rude. You'll be uh, stern to your patient. And yet these are people who have come to you because they had a, they had a problem. And I, uh, this has been said that we can make use of all available modes and means of communication, whether it's at your clinic, you can know when to show your to put on um, YouTube, you can put uh, uh, leaflets for your patient to read. Or So uh, using all those as has been said, and in the final way of concluding is that you can learn, you can go and find ways to improve yourself. Thank you very much. Um, Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mbwayo um, and our presenter, Dr. Wawa. Um, it is very um, interesting to hear about uh, communication, especially the nonverbals. Um, those of us in mental health, we know sometimes the incongruence that um, is there between um, the verbals and the nonverbals. So that was very, um, uh, very informative um, for us from Dr. Wawa. And Dr. Mboy. So just before we, we go into the questions, um, I'd like to maybe ask uh, one of the participants one question. Um, this is um, about communication between um, those who are close to, uh, between those who are close to us and when um, do we need intervention? For example, communicating between uh, uh, between spouses or communicating between children. We know sometimes communication doesn't go well. When do we need um, to, when do we need intervention? Or when do we need um, somebody to come in between? So maybe Peter, you can uh, uh, unmute Dr. Bukusi and we can hear what he has to say about that. Dr. David Bukusi. Good evening. Can you hear me now? Yes, good evening, Dr. Ah, we can hear you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. No, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we're on the same page. And uh, thank you again for this really very, very interesting um, presentation that you've been putting across, uh, Dr. Wawa and uh, Dr. Mbwayo, about communication and, uh, and, and mental illness or, and or mental health. In fact, we should be going at, at it from that particular perspective. And there's communication, yes, of course. Uh, you're communicating with the world, we're communicating with the community, we're communicating with society, we're communicating with our patients, um, all in the name of um, promoting mental health. Uh, but then uh, when we bring it right back to ourselves in, 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 in our immediate spheres of influence, that's our families, um, our partners, and our, in terms of our wives or our husbands and children and the people whom we interact with on a regular, very, very daily basis. It, um, it does um, provide, um, it, it, it provides a structure around which a lot of mental ill health actually um, is generated. Now, one of the things which informs this, the communication is presumably, you know, you're passing across one idea to, from the self to another or listening to something from somebody else which you're receiving. Now, 
in this day and age, sometimes that causes a bit of a problem. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this is because we are now in the age, we have moved from the age of collectivism, where we had common understandings, um, much more to a world of individualism, where we're now actually targeting what we want is what I want. Hello? Yes, uh, just go ahead, Dr. Harris. I'm back. Yeah, something seemed to have gone off. So when we start creating, when we, we now start moving to live into that environment in which we ourselves are the ones who are of, of, of sole importance or of primary importance, then it does bring itself, it does bring with it challenges to the concept of communication. Because what we mean when we're saying whatever it is that we're saying may be somewhat different from um, what other people may understand when they hear whatever it is that we're saying. So it's just something to, 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 to keep in mind. Um, this, it, this, this, the strength of individualism and its impact on how we communicate and how we interpret whatever it is that we're told um, really does have significance. Um, I've been given a short notice by uh, Liz, and so I'll just very quickly go through four particular key components um, of, of, of aspects which actually do cause serious stress within the, con within the context of communication, especially within relationships. Um, there's a fellow well, just over 20 years ago, or rather a couple, was called Gottman and Gottman. And they came, up, they came up with some four very interesting fellows. They call them the four horsemen. And they said, the, if these things arise within the context of a relationship in terms of communication, there will be serious challenges within that particular relationship. The first one is criticism. Here you are with a partner, with a child, and for all intents and purposes, your premise is primary, correct, and perhaps the only one um, that people should listen to. And so your role is for all intents and purposes to criticize the people around you. It comes across um, in a very awkward manner, very difficult, very painful to take. And remember the greater context, the greater um, substrate of relationships is a sense of vulnerability. So if somebody is being vulnerable in your presence because they're feeling free, they're, feeling, they're hoping to feel safe and what they will continue experiencing is criticism, it does beat a person down. That's the first horseman. The second one is contempt. And it's amazing how much contempt we um, communicate, even the way we discuss things. Ah, what are you talking about? You don't know anything. You haven't read. You don't know this. I have done this. You haven't. And dismissing each other's views in the context sometimes of company, sometimes just within the context of your own relationship. Dismissing each other, um, minimizing the significance of one, um, perhaps within the context of, um, of a relationship. It's, uh, it, it's very, very painful, very, very key to um, causing a very strong one, either power dynamic or um, even worse, creating a situation in which um, there's a huge chasm which is now caused, created between the two, if one starts treating one with contempt. The third one, very quickly, is defensiveness. When for everything that is put across, the sole response is, no, 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 I was doing it because of this, I was doing it because of that, I was doing it because of this. And so what is your partner supposed to feel? I mean, they're just putting across a comment they find it now hard to feel safe because if they ask you a question, you're going to go into the defensive. Maybe they're just putting across something they want to discuss, but now they're scared. They're not in a position to share with you um, or to share with others and you feel on the defensive, perhaps because of the same criticism that you've been getting within the context of that relationship. And the fourth uh, horseman, which is very, very critical within this context of, of, of relationships is stonewalling. Stonewalling when you start just saying yes, no, yes, no, or even worse, when now you now stop responding at all. So somebody's talking at you and you just switch off. You just completely ignore them. These four areas, these four particular horsemen, um, 
as I've indicated, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling are really relationship killers. And these are very clearly within the realms of communication. But once again, like I said, we, especially as we keep on talking about this age of individualism, when I am right, my interests are first, my, it is me primarily, there's a tendency not to listen to other people. And there's a tendency to start doing these kind of things, to start treating with contempt, to start criticizing everybody else, to start being defensive about what you have done because it was in your own interests in the first place, and to start stonewalling, dismissing what other people are saying. So these are some things that we need, to, it would be useful for us to keep in mind as we um, engage in, com in communication. And remember, within the context of a relationship, there's a need to be vulnerable. There's a need to present oneself, to allow oneself to be presented, um, to, allow you to, to allow you to have your weak spots um, open for anybody to see, and hoping that those on the other side in this relationship will be able to be gentle, will be able to be friendly, will be able to enhance the bonding that um, is required within the context of trying to strengthen a relationship. So. Um, uh, what you had asked me to mention, Liz, was just what, do, what would, could people do? What could people do with regards to this? Um, and one, I think, the first thing that I actually, because I've seen this so frequently in many, many relationships. In fact, Gottman actually used to say that he could predict within um, 80, 90 percent accuracy within the first five minutes when a couple has sat in front of him, whether that couple is going to separate or not just on the, base, on the way in which they communicate. And it's around these four factors. So one of the things that I'd be pretty keen on is just, first of all, just the promotion of healthy communication within relationships. And if that could be um, a public health agenda, if that could be a, psych a psychological, a mental health agenda, communication within relationships, it is so critical and so crucial because this is where a lot of people now end up suffering all sorts of, all forms of trauma, let alone other just uh, depressive illnesses, that anxiety disorders that may arise as a result of these particular issues. Of course, should therefore somebody find that uh, perhaps these are of um, a significant enough nature, then hopefully they may be able to seek um, treatment at counseling, psychotherapy. And if they seriously have serious mental illnesses, then they'll probably have to see a psychiatrist and get other forms of mental treatment. Um, thank you very much. Please forgive me those few minutes just to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time, Dr. Bukusi, um, to just um, talk about um, communication and relationships. So uh, we'll go now immediately to the questions. And um, I, I see, I noted that uh, Fatwell is here, so I, we will also make use of uh, his wonderful brains. Uh, to answer, maybe we can answer for us, um, asked by one of the participants, uh, how do you make sure, I'm assuming there's a sure here, how do you make sure you don't behave like the mental health patient? Prof, can you help us answer that one? Thank you, Liz. Um, <laughs> the, the first part of that question was that, uh, you know, you know a, a statement that uh, doctors tend to behave like their patients or that caregivers tend to behave like their patients and pediatricians behave like children and so on. And then saying psychiatrists behave like psychotics. Um, and what I said was that uh, it, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate uh, statement uh, for the simple reason that it's not true. It's a terrible joke. It has no basis in fact. Um, caregivers, have a burden of care to their patients. And because of this burden of care to their patients, whether they are nurses, clinical officers, doctors, they're at risk of uh, getting, you know, burnout or getting uh, some emotional distress as a result of the work they do. And we shouldn't uh, trivialize that in, in that manner. Um, at the end of the day, when you are in a therapeutic relationship with a patient, you are, the care provider and the patient has come to receive care from you and your responsibility is to figure out what needs your patient has and what kinds of solutions are available to you to provide for the patient. 
So there's no room there to start comparing who is behaving like who uh, and so on. And if your caregiving role results in emotional injury, then it will be time for you to take a break and to seek help from the professionals to reduce uh, any complications that can emanate from that. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Prof. Um, we also will invite uh, Dr. Mahanyango, who um, would like to make a comment on internet communication and uh, the complex aspects of communication for uh, mental health workers. Um, if you could unmute uh, Dr. Mahanyango. Peter is unmute Dr. Makanyango. Okay, unfortunately, I can't see the name on the list. So maybe we lost her. Um, but there are some other questions that have been answered. I hope um, we have gone through the Q&A. Uh, just to see what uh, how how these questions have been answered, um, especially one. I mean, they've been answered by by Prof. So um, he is actually saying, I am reflecting on the presentation and asking myself, am I mentally healthy? And she says it is a transforming teaching uh, when we learn each of and every one of us how to better our communication how to talk to our patients, how to talk uh, even to one another. So I don't know if there are any more questions or we can go on to the next step of the webinar. Um, there are some questions that have been asked about the CPD points. Uh, please note the point sent um, via email. So if you did register, uh, you will get, um, you will get your points. Just check your email. And if you don't get them, then you can contact uh, KME and they will send them right to you. Hello. So at least, yes. I'm Dr. Makanyengo. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes doctor. Uh, just quickly, um, wonderful presentation, but uh, needs more time. Um, there are some aspects of communication as a psychiatrist. I realize it would take you many years to 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 learn because of experience the nonverbal cues and they are very very, very impo important like body language yeah and even sometimes the silence and it's important we need to know that uh, uh, with time you find those skills will will sharpen and especially if you're you're sensitive and perceptive now the other thing I wanted to mention is the internet communication through internet which brings problems which becomes a danger to individual. And uh, I've come across uh, clients who um, have entered sites where they, they, they engage in certain sites that after some time they get depressed, some commit suicide. And there was a dangerous game that came into Kenya. It was something to do with blue whale, something about a whale uh, game which uh, ended up mind control on people who ended up uh, killing themselves. So, these are areas in communication. I think we still have much research to do. Like how do these sites affect people such that they have end up uh, in mind control? I just wanted to bring those as perhaps for future discussion. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Daktari. So one other question um, that I've just seen Prof post here uh, for Dr. Wawa. Um, a participant is asking, uh, how do we use the skills you shared to improve personal relationships? So, Dr. Wawa. Okay. Um, I think uh, Dr. Bukusi has, has, has touched a bit on that. 
on, on how we would use our, uh, our, the skills to, to just make our personal relationships better. But um, I think we, sh we could also just add on a few things such as just being clear about what, what uh, you're talking about to your partner or to, to your children or the people close to you. Um, be, be ready to accept feedback from them. It might be things that you don't want to hear, but be ready to accept feedback. And uh, we should also be very, um, is it open or careful to just look at the non-verbal communication that they're, they're sending our way so, so that we can be able to appreciate what it is they're saying. Sometimes they might not be saying anything, they're silent, but you can still see what they're, 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 how their body language is, or they might be saying one thing and their body language is saying another thing. So we can, we can also just sharpen those skills to be able to know what they're saying. Um, I think that's uh, what I can think about right now. If anybody else has anything to add, they could add. Um, uh, Liz, um, somebody asked um, us to comment on issues of special needs and communication. And yeah. I think it's a, it's a, it's a useful, useful extension of the discussion that we've just had, uh, that when you communicate, I think we cannot emphasize enough that communication is a function of at least four uh, components. Uh, there is the source of the communication, then there is the message, and then there's the medium, and there's the recipient. Uh, when we're talking about special needs in terms of the recipient, we, have that we, we, are, we are then having to tailor our message so that it suits the recipient. If the recipient has special needs, then how we communicate our message, the medium we use, the content of the message itself must be tailored to the needs of this individual. And as far as communication is concerned, I would venture to say that everybody has special needs because of the complex interplay between the source, the content, uh, the message itself, the medium, and the recipient. So in that, in that interaction, each and every one of us receives a message or transmits a message differently. And in that regard, we have special needs. So if you want to communicate to a particular demographic, you must tailor the message so that it has a high probability of reaching the largest number in that demographic. And therefore consider that all the recipients of your message have special needs and that you as a communicator probably also has special needs that you must be aware of that could hinder your ability to communicate with others. And once you recognize that, then you become more conscious about how you communicate, what you communicate, and the content of that communication. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, that was actually, yeah, as you were speaking, I was actually thinking about also when we communicate with children and um, we try to talk to them as if they're short adults. Um, yeah. If we don't tailor really our communication to their developmental level, we tend to lose them. So um, that, that is actually a very valid point. So one other question we have, um, and I think I'll send this off to uh, Dr. Mbwayo. Uh, what help is available for couples whose relationship is breaking due to poor communication? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, for such couples, I think it would be good to find out uh, what help is around them. Like, uh, uh, is there a, a counselor, a clinical psychologist who is around them, who can be able to listen to them, to help them, to guide in terms of the areas like uh, what Dr. Bukusi has talked uh, has talked about. So for such a couple, I think the best thing is to look for around what is the nearest help that is available for them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Terry. Um, I, I also have one question that I, I thought I'd um, ask, um, I'd ask Prof. Atsuoli. Um This is something every psychologist who works in the clinical setting has actually encountered uh, when sometimes there is a uh, bad token and we find that um, some doctors or some, 
some, some people in the medical profession have difficulty with giving this bad news. Uh, Prof, maybe you can ask how, how is this handled or how do, we, how, how do the medical personnel do this? And let's say in, the, in a place where clinical psychologists or no psychologists. Um, so thank you, Liz. Uh, first, I want to confirm if I can be heard. I think my connection is a bit touch and go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I think uh, uh, one, one tenet that I hold on to is that if I'm taking care of a patient and something bad happens, the primary responsibility of breaking bad news lies with me. Uh, but I have noticed, of course, over the years, that uh, people in the medical profession, uh, clinicians, and uh, those of us taking care of patients uh, have started to relegate this responsibility to clinical psychologists and other mental health workers. I think clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, other counselors, and other mental health workers exist to support you when a patient, for instance, has received bad news and is reacting in a particular way, then these mental health experts, including clinical psychologists, would be available to support the patient to cope with that difficulty and to deal with any catastrophic reactions emanating out of receiving bad news. But we shouldn't uh, make it the business of the mental health workers and psychologists to be the ones to go and break bad news to patients because there's a certain dynamic and there's a certain responsibility that lies with those of us that are taking care of the patient to continue with that relationship even after something bad has happened uh, and to manage it. And if we have difficulties communicating bad news or we have difficulties handling bad news as providers ourselves, then we need to reflect we need to get help from the experts on how to better communicate bad news and how to better handle bad news in order that we can support our patients and their relatives better. So in my view, if uh, we make a diagnosis of cancer, a patient has just received a diagnosis of, or, I mean, we have just discovered that a patient has cancer. It is the oncologist who should find a safe place uh, together with the team that is caring for the patient to sit and communicate this diagnosis in a sensitive way and in a way that is tailored to the patient's needs. Now, if the patient has difficulty managing or handling that bad news, uh, then we would say, Liz, uh, kindly support this patient who has just received a diagnosis of cancer, and we think uh, she or he needs you to help them walk uh, that journey as we go forward and to support us as a clinical team to ensure that she's in a frame of mind to get the treatment we're giving her. So that is how I look at it. But I know that uh, many uh, clinicians have over the years started giving away that responsibility. In many of our courses and programs, there is a unit on you know, uh, giving, uh, how to um, give bad news to patients or to relatives. But I, I think over time, this is being watered down. And uh, as we get more and more psychologists, more and more counselors coming in the clinical setting, people are assuming that this is now the primary responsibility of those people. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Uh, so as uh, we, I think we wind down um, and, and uh, go towards ending uh, the webinar for today. Um, before we go, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the, um, we are doing well, uh, we are receiving more and more calls, but we do know that a lot of us are still not reaching out when we need the call center or when we need to talk to somebody. Um, I encourage you, I encourage all of us, if we should need to talk to somebody, um, whether, it's, whether you just need to, to just offer or whether you are actually uh, feeling like you're having a mental health issue going on, please uh, reach out to the call center. We have clinical psychologists on board. We have psychiatrists on board. And we have uh, mental health practitioners who are they are actually the ones that are receiving uh, your calls at the call center. So these are people, these are nursing, uh, nursing mental health specialists, clinical officer mental health specialists. We have medical psychologists who are just on the other side of the phone and uh, waiting to speak to you should you need them. 
as we end, I'd also like to thank our presenters. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Sarah Wawa. Thank you very much. That was a very, very informative webinar that we have done today. And, uh, the lead panelist who is uh, Dr. Um, Mbwayo. Um, very well, well done. I appreciate also all those who have contributed to answer questions and to clarify um, things when the, the, they were not clear and answer the questions. I, there is nobody today from KMA uh, to give us, so with this very few regards, I'd just like to say that uh, um, we won't have a webinar next week because it's Mashuja Day. So we will return on the 27th. And um, before that, uh, the title of our next webinar will be sent out to you. And uh, please look out for the poster. Thank you very much and have a good. Thank you very much. And uh, Prof, we can't hear you. Sarah, oh, I'm very proud of you. You uh, really come along with. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those comments, Prof. Um, good night, all. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good good night. Night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night.